Hi, Beanie. Hi, Emo. Coach Scott, we have, he was driving or something? What happened to Coach yeah, Scott? Leaving. You look so cute, Donnie. You have lipstick on. Little I just in and out one just for you. Stuff. I just went upstairs and did that. Excellent. And Utam. Me too. Are you going to show us your new piano? <laughs> Hello, Miss M. Hey. What are you drinking there, girlfriend? Water. Nice. <laughs> you? <Prost. laughs> yeah. Everyone. I guess I can tech drop. How are you doing? Great. Oh, that's nice, Justin. I'm sharing. <laughs> Amy's sharing. You're good that way. <laughs> are you seeing the scary. piano, AC? You got to look at the piano. I'm trying to see. Oh, I'm not oh my goodness. Beautiful. Wow. Beautiful. Oh, beautiful. And your artwork looks lovely. She, does she know she's. Your sound is not on, Beanie. Bean, you're on mute. You know? <laughs> we can't hear you playing. <laughs> I played Happy Birthday. You see? I even have. Very nice. Wow. Happy birthday to Jim. Did only you have both hands going at the same time, Bean? No, only the right hand. I felt that that was good. Uh -huh. That's very advanced, Beanie. <laughs> right. Um, where is the birthday guy? Sleeping. <laughs> it was a big meal. <laughs> What'd you make? I made Zuni chicken. Wow, it's so Ooh, sweet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and we had nine people. Wow. My goodness. So I don't know if you can see the we had the tables pulled apart for social distancing. You're in wonder, Beanie. Oh, yeah, we're watching COVID parties now. Great. <laughs> <laughs> well, isn't that, we're, aren't we here to talk about the COVID parties that we've been no, having? <laughs> we're going to Berlin for the next biggie there. <laughs> hey, how was the wedding? I have not talked to Mary Beth, but talked to Eddie and uh, looked like it was, or sounded like it was wonderful. Oh, okay. Good. What were those pictures from? Uh, this cool new um, place in Sheridan called the Welcome something, Welcome House. It's an old depot. And so they have a time, t like a timetable, you know, with the flipping things. And it, they had a big heart for the wedding party. I will just uh, share if I can. Utam, our nephew just got married on Friday. Oh, congratulations. Where yeah. was the wedding? In Wyoming. So, oh, okay. But none of us were there, so that was um, hard. Can you share your I can imagine. Yeah. Did you at least uh, join remotely through Skype or something? They yeah. didn't do that. But they're going to have a party for their anniversary. The okay. bride and groom are on the right. And his brother on the left. Yeah, just to oh, okay. avoid the hat here and look at uh, the other people here. I see. <laughs> but isn't that fun? That <laughs> signboard. When is the baby due? September. Rachel and Nick. So, and Joe is donating a kidney to. Uh, Elise's dad. Soon. Wow. Oh, yeah. wow. Yeah. The nephew that just got married, his wife's dad needs a kidney. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. So, okay. um, uh, yeah, I'm so, so glad that uh, so many of you could uh, make it back for yet another Novel CoVision 2020. Uh, it's pretty fun. And you guys are so creative. It's fun to talk about your projects. Uh, after the last meeting, uh, Utam sent these uh, these great pictures here. And let's see. Uh, shoot, I can't click on them. Let me see if I can um, take them off the desktop. Yeah. Utam, they're great. 
I'm, I'm just learning, you know, I get pretty bored over the, <laughs> over the last few months. So I've been trying to learn to paint. So it's still, yeah. <laughs> oh, they're terrific. <laughs> Yeah, it's That's awesome. That's so good. Are they of specific places that are meaningful to you? or No, really. I was just fantasizing about where I want to live <laughs> in future. So Yeah, why don't you tell us, uh, take your time and tell us a little bit about them. Uh, sure. Well, I mean, I guess... Which one do you I want? Mean, we, can, we can talk about the, the second one. Uh, yeah, which is on the screen there. It's actually, um, so I, I copied uh, the painting from uh, this individual who uh, is from, uh, let's see, somewhere Central Valley in California. Mm -hmm. He's a farmer there. Uh, and he's the one who, who was the, let's see, if I can remember the, the congressman's name, who, uh, give just a second. Hey, Marta, yeah. who was the congressman who, uh, uh, from, from Northern California, he was, I forgot, like, uh, there was a Twitter feed on his cow or something. Oh, Devin Nunes. Huh? Devin Nunes. Devin Nunes. <laughs> so he's, he, uh, this, this artist is from Devin Nunes, uh, district. I don't know if you guys know of him. Yes. Uh, so... Uh, you know, they, they, they sued him because uh, apparently David Newton is still writing himself as a farmer and they sued him uh, to uh, basically redefine what, you know, what, who can tell farmer, you know, as a profession and so on. But anyway, so this individual, he, he paints his own farm. So a lot of these paintings are his farm. I haven't been there, but I found them online. So uh, it's really just, and also I, I, uh, at the same time, I was reading the Brett Burns uh, oh, book. <laughs> it was a beautiful book. Uh, actually, a lot of the, 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 the description around, you know, how people were virtually untouched by the rest of the world, you know, living their own life. Uh, that was very similar to the way I, I grew up. You know, we, we had basically zero presence of government, gover government you know, in, in where we live, uh, back in Nepal. So... Uh, so I, I don't know, it reminded me of just, you know, sort of a self-contained, you know, very poor life, but at the same time, self-contained life, people do their own thing, you know, they, they are happy in whatever way they can make themselves happy. And, and I was, you know, while reading the book, I looked for a picture of barn and then painting a barn and this came up. So I was like, you know, that would be nice to have a little house, you know, with the barn and, and a little bit of field and some fruits and mountains <laughs> and so on. So that, that was it. Uh, there's nothing more to it than that. But there are a few elements. I, I love mountains mm -hmm. and I, I want to be in a place with mountains at some point in the future. Uh, so, you know, a lot of these paintings, I like to have little mountains or hills or something. So nice with some fruits and whatnot. The other painting, if you go, it's it's also something similar. I, I believe I saw something similar online, but it reminded me of, again, quote unquote, the simpler life I used to have growing up. Mm -hmm. And I was, and then Marta, you know, both of us have been talking quite a bit on how do we want to live our life in future? Because uh, we don't want to be dying in a big city, <laughs> you know, working, working all the time. Uh, we don't have lab here. I don't see any laser labs. Either. I know. <laughs> the lab will be somewhere in the barn. <laughs> my, my advisor uh, back in Michigan uh, was someone similar. Uh, he, uh, he, he got his PhD. He was unhappy with things. He went to medical school for a little bit. He dropped out of medical school. He was in HRL with George Valley, Justin. Uh, they worked together for a little bit. And then he, he became a faculty back in Michigan. Uh, and he was running a farm with, you know, 50 cows and, you know, several acres of fruits, you know, and apple orchard and things like that. Uh, so he would wake up three in the morning, you know, tame his, I guess, animals and, and whatnot, and then would come to school. And he was a faculty in like three or four different departments. Yes. <laughs> but he was very, you know, down to earth, 
uh, humble person. And, and I don't know, we had many discussions, you know, more beyond in you know, the physics while working with him. And the, the basic idea that, you know, our connection with nature and in life around uh, that has sort of faded, you know, over time. And we all are now accustomed to living in a tiny apartment, not understanding, you know, the million years of evolutionary path, you know, we all took and, and, and long history uh, and then sort of the idea of coexistence, you know, uh, mm -hmm. sort of this notion of uh, men taming wild, you know, men taming the beast sort of become the new, uh, new, new norm, right? Uh, so, and that has problem. I think a lot of the problems we're seeing in the world are coming from that very idea of we, you know, are above everything and we need to tame everything to be underneath us rather than we coexist together with other things in nature and we need to find a better sort of a uh, more sustainable coexistence, you know, that will hopefully keep us in the loop for a very long time. So, yeah, so anyway, so, you know, both Marta and I want to go somewhere, you know, a small town, hopefully with, you know, some fruits and, you know, do your own thing. Have you on barn like in the book? <laughs> so <laughs> you have a positive outlook for uh, a transition to a sustainable future. I, I don't think it's going to happen. I think our society is too drunk and, and too, I, 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 I think we, I mean, the way I see how the, the society and then, you know, uh, the world is heading towards, I think uh, a lot of us are in denial, right? We think it will be sustainable this way because nature will work somehow. And uh, there are gonna be mass ecological disaster in my view, that's gonna, you know, that will happen more and more often. And, you know, it become a system where there's always, you know, even among poverty, among des you know, desperation, all that, there's always ways for people to fist, you know, whatever they want and then, you know, and, and then control the resource. So that's what people will, I think, continuously do because they can always, um, you know, take advantage of the dire situation and still be on top of it. Uh, so it doesn't matter to the powerful, you know, quote unquote, rich and powerful, because they will always find a way to get around the disaster. Whereas the, the, the rest of the world, I mean, will go into that massive disaster. And we're going to see these masses called refugees issues and, and things like that, you know, happening throughout the world. Um, so unfortunately, I don't think it's going to head in the sustainable direction, unless our younger generation, you know, because... I have some hope about the younger generation, you know, because people seem to be a lot more conscious and aware of what's happening and the consequ consequences of what they, you know, what they, they do or how they live. So it's, it's really hard. You, you see, you know, people that dedicate their life to trying to turn around at the society and it just seems so hopeless. It's like a, um, you know, uh, a puppy trying to stop a train. Uh, and uh, you see it, but uh, it's just, it's, uh, it's heartbreaking. Who's that, that girl who's doing the, uh, the strikes for the environment? Greta Thunberg. Uh, She's turned her whole life around. Mm -hmm. We all admire her, but we still keep careening towards this uh, future that, uh, you know, it seems, it seems inevitable. I, don't, I, I, I have a, very skeptical that we're going to be able to stop this thing in time before a disaster occurs. I, I, I again, I, I think it's partly because of the fundamentally different way of our thinking uh, to be blamed. I, I again, I, I think I'm not trying to pick on any ethnic groups or any any race or any 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 specific being, but. Uh, the, the sort of the notion of, you know, God created human being as a special, you know, uh, who are, you know, and everything around them is put for them to, to, to utilize and then to, to, you know, to take advantage of, you know, in some sense. When the oil has gone, Jesus is going to come back. So we don't need to worry about that. So, yeah, it's, it's all these so, 
are meant for our use. Exactly. So, so, so as long as we, you know, uh, you know, until we have that thought, you know, right, like human being in some sense, you know, have to, you know, I'm going to say, quote unquote, give up mm. and, and realize that, mm. you know, we are this pretty insignificant uh, being, you know, in this larger scheme of things. And, and the only way uh, for, for, for all of us to, to be able to part of this thing is, you know, by acknowledging our, you know, we are not as powerful as we think. And then we need to create more sustainable way of looking at things. Because if, if you look, I mean, again, this is, I see a fundamental change in the mindset because if you look at any traditional society, you know, they all have sort of quote unquote animistic, um, animistic element to in their all, all belief and in religion. And the animistic belief, you know, fundamentally comes from the realization that we are part of the bigger system, right? Part of the nature and nature as a whole is a big living organism. The rivers have, you know, have its soul, the trees has its soul, you know, the forest has its life, you know. And then so, but that view said completely changed and we saw everything around us as inanimate, inanimate, you know, robotic object, whereas we are in a sort of a special being. And until we keep that belief, it's going to be hard. You know, we need to, I think, you know, go back to, I mean, I am, I, I am not, you know, I don't subscribe to any religion, you know, traditional religion, but we need to go back to our animist, you know, the instinct, you know, which is all in us, right? We all think everything around us is, you know, living and then has its own soul, you know, metaphorically speaking. Uh, well, I've got some to say, but I want to hear some other people chime in. Just kidding. Uh, Beanie, climate. I was trying to say too. Oh, Beanie, go. Because I was just, you know, listening and, you know, a little bit of pessimism, I think, rightly so. Um, one of the things that I think Jim and I have noticed being in Wyoming is that it is very hard to do the right thing when the infrastructure is not set up to make that easy. And so in California, right, like we have a bigger compost bin, the second largest recycling, tiny garbage. And it is like trivially easy to do the right thing with respect to at least like household trash. And here, it is just so hard. And, you know, like there's no longer, it used to be that there was like this, you know, cardboard and glass. And so Jim would like go and collect from like the, you know, like moms and puppies. And then he would like drive wherever to recycle it. And now they've closed some of those. And so like we throw out plastic and cardboard and like I'm trying to make projects up to make stuff out of them but we actually have more glass and you know I don't I don't have much time and it just is such a reflection of like like how the infrastructure can really help people behave differently um, and lacking it 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 feels like our, like it feels impossible to do the right thing also I think things being cheaper you know, in some sense, it was a great, you know, it brought people out of, I guess, you know, low living standard, but also things being cheaper. It's kind of a curse, I think, because you could just buy it. Why mend it? You know, when you can, you know, just toss it away, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, all of that stuff, I, I think, you know, if you were uh, recycling everything and driving a... Um, an electric car, I think it's uh, uh, like uh, rearranging the, the deck chairs on the Titanic. Uh, it's, you know, you can do that. And it still seems so hopeless to me to, to do your part. And, you know, why? It's, it's, it's hard to even imagine uh, that it's making any uh, difference whatsoever. It's a gigantic problem. I, I, I agree. This is why I think it, it goes down to our roots of our thinking, in my view, because that, the, 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 again, I'm going to use the, metaphorically, you know, the animistic part of us, right, where we see life in everything, we see soul in everything, you know, everything is part of us, you know, sort of we are part of this bigger force of nature. 
that got taken away from us. And then the, the, the new, I guess, you know, quote unquote, the radical way of looking at us as a spatial being, you know, put in, in place, you know, in this earth for us to experience and enjoy, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, maybe the burden is on those religious community to try to bring those, you know, quote unquote, animistic, you know, element of it back, which is fundamentally, you know, naturalistic. Right. I mean, fundamentally, not just naturalists, sorry, environmentalists. I mean, when I think about in a lot of things, you know, that we were taught in, in, in you know, in, for example, in Hinduism, which, which is what my parents were from. Everything you look at in it, it has natural uh, sort of environmentalist part to it because, you know, it's built around with the assumption that everything has equal right. You know, even the, 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 the stump, the, the, the dead tree has equal right some form, you know, some, some abstract form, and it, it has right to be there, right? Whereas we don't have that mindset, I think, and, and in my view, it's gone too far. You know, they will milk everything, you know, until it becomes a dry, lifeless place, you know, and they will still find a way to milk it and make money out of it, right? They, in a sense, I don't know, wherever it will be. Well, I, I don't know. I, I... You know, the, the, uh, the pessimistic side of me thinks that we're careening towards a, a, a massive uh, die-off of people, a reset. I think there'll be survivors, but uh, I don't think we'll probably uh, get through this without uh, you know, major disasters. Uh, I, I, I agree with you. I, I think we have become those breads of uh, different bread of dogs, right? I mean... They were a wild creature, but now a lot of those, I'm, I'm not terrible with names, you know, those tiny puppies and, and dogs, if you were to leave them alone, they will die in a few weeks. They can't live months on their own. I think we have become someone like that. <laughs> Go ahead. Tina. I have a question. Just, it's just a few of us. So just chime in. I'm sorry? You can just chime in. I think it's just a few of us. Okay, well, I don't know. Anyway, okay. so um, I just wanted to ask you, Justy, so if you, like, I don't want, I think you're probably right. You're a smart fellow. You're usually right. Um, but I don't want to believe you. So I am <laughs> going to purposely, like, I'm going to willfully not adopt your perspective. And so, but. You like, I love that. I don't want to adopt it either. Okay, but if I actually, like, there's a part of me that like actually thinks you're right. And so if that's the case, what to do then? Right. Like what? So, so if that's our view, like that we, then we have other actions we can take and, um, you know, and they're probably good for your children, right. And Donnie's children and other people I care for. Um, and so, so what do you think about that? Well, I think, you know, uh, I have to just assume that it's going to be okay. You know, I, maybe I die, maybe everyone I know dies. It's, you know, we've got this thing and it's happened before. We all just have one life to give. We're all going to die eventually anyways. It's, it can be, I can, I'm coming to the point where I can be okay with it. And my choice is to run for the hills and tr learn survival skills, become a prepper, which you know, I, I'm not sure I'm that type of guy either. I think I, I, well, but Amy's good at baking, so you got that. <laughs> you got like the ace in the hole there. So <laughs> I'm not good at that kind of baking. <laughs> what were you gonna say? I Andrew, ju Justin, I think the partly I agree with you that you know we are on the sinking Titanic, you know on the back end of it. But the way I see it again, I mean, this is something I thought about quite a bit. And let's say if Marta is convinced by the end of this, you know, <laughs> the COVID, you know, by the by the time we get back or not. But I think again, I'm I'm not religious by any you know traditional uh, definition, but uh, I'm gonna use words uh, because of lack of you know appropriate words. I think we need to have some sort of spiritual reckoning as a as, as a modern day, you know, human being, where we need to all recognize what exactly we are doing, you know, what is, what is it meant to be, you know, our long, you know, history, 
you know, you will listen to history, how human being almost went extinct. At some point there were 1000 or less than 1000 human being, you know, it, not that long ago, you know, uh, if you look at, if you look at our history and sort of the realization that we are tiny piece of the, the puzzle, somehow we, ha you know, got equipped with a lot of power and we went rogue, you know, and we are, you know, we are, you know, we are, the, the mad chimpanzee jumping around, destroying the whole habitat. Yeah, 100,000 so, Americans have died because we can't decide to wear a mask. And we need to do way bigger changes than wear a fucking mask. I, 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 I think we, we can't even decide on that. That's what's making me realize we don't have a chance. There's no chance. I don't see a way that we can come to an agreement about something that's important and big and life-changing when we can't even agree about wearing a mask. I, I agree, yeah. <laughs> so, so, you know, I was thinking about this thing also, you know, the role of religion and in, in things like this. Again, I'm not a religious person and I didn't subscribe to any religion, but maybe there is a role uh, because ultimately a lot of these institutions are very powerful organizations that somehow have control over the mass, right? So the mass could be dumb, the mass could be ignorant, but somehow, you know, they, they find a way to control them, right? And again, I mean, it could go bad and then things, things go cuckoo very quickly also, you know, which we have seen in history. But at the same time, uh, maybe they would be the honest, quote unquote, they, we could have honest, you know, broker uh, in, within the religious community where uh, they can take whatever influence they have to, to bring people back to sense. And, and this is something I was, again, I was talking with Marta saying, maybe, you know, the, the attitude that religion is fundamentally wrong and we should distend ourselves, you know, which is the common attitude a lot of, you know, educated people take. Maybe that's a flawed approach to this whole problem because uh, fundamentally human beings aren't rational, as you just say, you know, they, they aren't rational. They will not do things that's, that's, that's you know, that, that makes the most sense. So who is there to, 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 to take those, you know, herd of people and then, and then direct them in the right path? Well, you know, either politician, you know, you can wear the MAGA hat and then make people, you know, follow you, or maybe you can use that through religion. And, and now if the religion, religious institution are taken by more and more extremists, you know, then we lose that grip either also, right? We don't have that now. Even the religious extremists, you know, well, I guess religions are taken by the extremists, there's, which is basically no hope. So if we, if there will be more sensible people, you know, where they understand certain value of religion and, and this mass control, you know, of people and, and, and have a reasonable voice there, right? It's, it's basically like if the government is pretty bad, you can't just let it run because some crazy will come and take over. At least you try to install your, you know, people with, with good faith and hopefully they will fight you know, on your behalf. So that's why maybe we should not be alienating religious community and religion and rather, you know, people who ever have sense try to join the bigger, you know, bigger force and try to redirect it into the, the direction that makes the most sense, you know, which means in this case, you know, not having ecological disaster by doing, you know, things, greedy things like making money. You know. well, I appreciate your optimism. I'm going to try to adopt that. Anthony, <laughs> uh, I think you want to say something. Yeah, I really appreciate you bringing that up, Utan, because that's something I've been thinking about a lot recently. I've been having trouble in my young, naive mind trying to reconcile the uh, greed and lust for power that seems to drive a lot of the problems that I perceive in the world today. And uh, I, was, I was thinking about uh, uh, Friedrich Nietzsche and his, um, when, when he talked about how uh, God was dead and that we were uh, uh, moving towards a society in which the values of human beings were not determined by, by uh, uh, a supernatural being, that it would lead to the sort of ubermensch where um, people would be driven by the desire to bring meaning into their lives by becoming their best selves. And, um, one of the major criticisms of Nietzsche that, that I have read is that instead that world would devolve into one in which people are mainly driven by a desire to 
um, acquire as much personal wealth and power as they can. And, you know, I am not going to be advocating for any organized religion by any means, but it's just so difficult for me to reconcile the, the greed and selfishness that seems to prevail today and how that I can't understand how anyone could possibly derive personal fulfillment from that kind of, uh, from that kind of attitude towards the world. And, it's, and I don't, I don't know what the solution is, but, you know, maybe, maybe a more um, faithful religious uh, attitude would at least rectify that, whether or not I uh, philosophically agree with it. Yeah, I, it's, I've been struggling with that idea a lot. <laughs> this, I mean, I, I, I agree with you and human being definitely, including myself, you know, I am, you know, the rationality is a tiny part of me, right? I mean, they, they have some studies where uh, people who are extremely rational, um, you know, when you remove quote unquote the subjective part of the brain, actually people get crippled, you know, they can't take decisions, they can't do anything because there are all these competing force and you can't decide until you understand the whole situation. Then life is, life doesn't work that way. Oftentimes we do make sort of a, you know, in, instinctive, you know, decision and then move on, right? And like whether, for example, if there's a noise, you know, rustle, or rustling of leaves or something outside my house, I have to make the instinctive decision and decide, you know, it's, it's a tiger or whatever it is and run, right? So ultimately, I guess we are driven by that pretty blind uh, force of, you know, nature. Uh, my favorite philosopher, Schopenhauer, which I just realized my book is right here, you know, is a, a great, great pessimistic, you know, writer. I love him. Uh, I, I find it comical how pessimistic he is. Uh, <laughs> So he, he talks about this blind will, you know, which is taking over uh, us, you know, and we are the, just the blind will moving, you know, in this space time with the sole purpose of, you know, reproducing and, and, and you know, ego. And so knowing all that, I don't have too much faith in humanity as a, as a whole, you know, and I agree with both of you guys that, uh, you know, we, I, I don't know, you know, the, the, it seems like things will quickly devolve if you let people, you know, if you let people, yeah, the, the go, go, go the way they, they, they are going, at least right now. Okay, okay well, uh, awesome, lovely discussion. Uh, Tammy, you also sent some uh, lovely pictures of your garden. Oh, yeah. so I, just, I just wanted to, I don't know if you guys can see this woodcut, oh, but Utam, I just uh -huh. thought that so, Jesse, if you could put his, his um, picture back up. I thought the peaked roof here. Um, so this is a wood cut. And, oh. um, and it's very reminiscent, I think, for, um, of like the shape of the farmhouse. And oh. this is a book of um, Wendell Berry and Amy's dad. Um, uh, who meant a lot to many of us, um, like loved him. And so this was a gift that Dwani gave to Jim today. And it has beautiful, beautiful woodcuts and it reminded me of your painting. Oh, well, great. Well, thank you. I'm going to, I'm going to get that book. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, beautiful pictures. Yeah. Yeah. There are many, many beautiful ones. In there. Great. Uh, on the non-pessimistic track <laughs> of the conversation. Oh, so there. Oh. <laughs> thank you so much. We, we, we're non-pessimists. Uh, as much as possible. I, we want to believe. Actually, if I could just make a comment, Utam, I think your paintings are amazing. I think they are so alive, um, like the trees are alive, and even the, the street is alive, and um, uh, keep painting, man. Thank you. I... I, I appreciate it. I mean, it's especially your trees are <laughs> just tremendous. They are so powerful. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. For me, it's it's you know I'm like damn I can't you know I was joking with Marta that one day I need to sit down and just draw trees, you know like Bob Ross would draw happy little trees. I need to make you know happy little trees, angry little trees, you know all kind of trees. 
Because I'm, I'm still struggling with, you know, drawing them properly, but or painting them. Properly. Oh, well, you, you've mastered it, dude. You're done. You got it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. I, I actually uh, put a collage of all those different uh, paintings I, I drew over the last few months. Uh, I think, Justin, you have those uh, in one of those. Oh, I, I only have the two. The the slide I send you, the third page has that with those plants. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here. Uh, you mean the... Uh, with those flowers? If you go to the last slide, slide three. Okay. <laughs> Can I just say, your garden is so tidy. Oh, I have our weeds. And so I'm like tremendously jealous about the garden. Well, I mean, we... We, I mean, yeah, well, I guess we, we mulch it properly, so, you know, it's okay. I mulch, yeah. dude, I mulch, <laughs> mulch yeah. yeah. I don't know, <laughs> maybe we just use an excuse, you know, to go to the garden and work all the time. <laughs> uh, so, so there are like few, a few paintings I, 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 I drew, uh, the, the center one uh, is, is my favorite, uh, uh, with the little Little, yeah, the little house uh, cabin with the mountain and the trees and all that. Again, I saw that picture somewhere, uh, and it's not my original creation in that sense. But the image on the right on top, uh, even though it doesn't look that good, the very top, yep, uh, that, uh, I already talked about it a little bit, if, if that's okay. Uh, so I have been, uh, so I recently got a telescope uh, and I've been trying to do some uh, photography, astrophotography. And uh, there's this one nebula called Ring Nebula, which is a pretty easy target uh, that I sent pictures to Justin also. So I've been, you know, spending late night, you know, over the weekend, you know, just, I guess, looking at, at the sky and to trying to take pictures and so on. And one of these nights I had this super vivid dream that that was that was almost just it was you know I must be in mushroom or something you know <laughs> I didn't do any drugs but it felt that way that <laughs> dreams. so I, I was standing and then looking down on the the, the horizon uh, and it was you know it was a pretty peaceful evening we we're on top of these flat roof top house the people around doing their own thing looked at the sky and then I realized uh, there was a supernovae expl ex explosion, you know, happening in the sky. And as I was watching, you know, the supernovae happen and turned this beautiful, bright, colorful sky. And then it started growing and growing and growing. And then I realized uh, by, you know, sort of that, that, that thing gonna come and annihilate all of us and we, we're gonna all be gone, right? And sort of that thing came so rapidly, right? The explosion of the supernovae, which apparently, you know, in my dream was eating away the universe. It, it expanded so rapidly that at some point it, 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 it just went through me. And as, as it swept through me, you know, it, 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 it basically dissolved every piece of matter, right? That's in front of me into sort of nothingness, right? Not even, you know, some energy or something, it truly converted into nothingness. And as, as it came through, I, I got that experience of getting eaten, you know, by the death of the universe and sort of becoming nothingness after that, right? And then poof, you know, like it was such a rapid process that it was a very peaceful, <laughs> you know, sort of, you know, uh, a very peaceful experience of, of being one with the universe, sort of, you know, ending, you know, the whole thing ending into nothingness. And it was, it was, it was very strange and, and as I said, you know, you know, very yeah. spiritual feeling. Yeah. Yeah, so so, or pessimistic. So which is it optimism or pessimism? <laughs> so so I, I call it optimism, you know, that's you know, I get it goes down to I guess some of the ideas in, in, in Hinduism of this sort of one universal, you know, awareness, consciousness, you know, and that that being the universe. And it goes to that, but it was just the, the feeling of dissolving into nothingness, right? It, it was bizarre and yet very peaceful. <laughs> so, so I woke up and I'm like, damn, you know, this is one of those rare dreams. 
I want to capture that, you know, and, and I try to paint it, paint that, even though it, nice. it looks awesome. okay. <laughs> yeah. That's really good. Oh, I think you totally got it. <laughs> I totally get that. I get that. It's so, beautiful. It's colorful. It, it was very vivid. <laughs> yeah. You stare into the universe and the universe stares back. Yeah, I, I guess right. so. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I like it. Thank you. Tell us about the one underneath that with the like meteor shower. Oh yeah, so I uh, I I actually just finished painting that uh, last night. Uh, it, it's it's it, it's a little hard to see in the image, but uh, it is supposed to be Milky Way with a, you know forest in the background with mm -hmm. maybe good sour and you know bright stars and all that. I I painted that for my old roommate uh uh so i'm gonna send it to him tomorrow or so oh, yeah. <laughs> for his birthday <laughs> i check my uh my google feed uh in the morning when i wake up and this morning i read that the uh you know that first picture of the black hole uh -huh. there, there's the rings of light that get crisper and crisper and crisper as you glow towards the uh the event horizon and what's happening is the lights going around it's doing orbiting around this black hole and a little bit of it escapes and uh reaches uh, you know reaches the the earth but that last image is a, a image of the history of the universe so that kind of your picture kind of reminds yeah. me of that too. can you send me that picture if you find it an oh, article i'll send you a picture of the i'll send you the article for sure okay perfect uh, what a great concept to think of like a physical representation of history. It's a little bit, you know, you physicists, you've got like the brain power to handle that, but I don't know. It's a, <laughs> I appreciate how cool it is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. Um, well, we've got uh, some other things to share. Uh, Donnie, do you, you've written some stuff. Would you like to uh, sh share that with us? Well, um, so I was going to just share um, three slides. I sent them to AC. AC, do you have them? Yes, I do. I'm sending them right now to Jesse. Sorry. Oh, my God. You're so bad that you didn't send them. I know. I just sent you some stuff on the back, and I didn't send it on to Jesse. Well, Tom, he has his loaded up. He looks like he knew what he was doing. Uh, yeah, I don't usually, though. You should know that by now. Log on, lay off of poor AC. She can handle it. She's fine. <laughs> Plus, I made Emily laugh. My work here is done, really. <laughs> she should be. Okay, so what I was... Oh, yeah? I'm sorry? Share your screen, if you don't mind. Yeah, you said if you had technical difficulties. That's why I didn't send it along, Donnie. Mm, okay, hold on. All right, I'm able to overcome. Here, bear I'm with me. We're learning and we're growing all together here. Yeah. Okay, I got it. I got it here. Let's see. So speedy. All right. So to share the screen, I would do. A big green button. I got it. I got it. Okay. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. So this is what I've been doing for the last couple of weeks. So, um, uh, Utam, I work for the VA, and so, um, uh, and I've been monitoring the COVID epidemic uh, um, for the VA. And like a lot of other um, reports have been about countries, like, you know, the experience in China, or like the experience in Lombardy, Italy, or, or like New York. And what struck me was that it's, really a local experience um, and that you know describing it at the whole population um, like obscures what's really going on locally so i just have three slides and then i just want to show you my notebook so um, the, what these slides are are just describing caseloads Right, so this upper panel is just the total number of patients per hospital. So you can see some hospitals, lots of patients, and each bar, each bar is a hospital. 
right? So there are 160 VA hospitals and you can see some have had like 700 patients and some have had one, okay? So you can kind of see how like that pattern is true for all of these, right? So that's all patients. These are the bottom left is the number of patients who were admitted to the hospital. This upper right one is the number of patients who, um, oh my goodness, it went away. Let me get it back. Pardon me. We can, we can see it. Oh, you can still see it? Yeah. Okay. I can't see it though, so that's a problem. <laughs> top, top right is I see you. It says my resume share. I see you. There we go. Okay, so if you can see it, that's awesome because I can't. But um, uh, here, uh, well, I know what it shows. And so um, I'll just, uh, oh, I found it. Oh, goodness gracious. Okay, so anyway, um, what I wanted you to see was that um, uh, the bottom right is that uh, there are some ICUs that have a lot of ventilator patients and other facilities where the ICUs don't have so many ventilator patients. And, um, and I just kind of wanted to show like what a ventilator patient looks like, right? So this is, a, this is a picture from a New York hospital and here's a gentleman with COVID who's on the ventilator and there's, the patients are just like totally wired up and you know, they've got the vent going and here's this poor healthcare worker. Like you have to like, you know, like lean in because you really can't hear what the, you know, like you're trying to talk and it's just, it's really um, onerous for the staff to have patients on a ventilator. Um, and there was this report that came out that um, in New York City, 20% of the patients were on ventilators and 80% of the patients who were on a ventilator died. And so that just seemed like, oh my God, what's happening in New York? Well, um, if you look at the mortality rates, so this is 45 day mortality rates, 45 days from the time of the COVID test. Um, you can see, so, you know, this is uh, in the upper left, it's overall mortality for anyone, but really the interesting thing is the bottom right panel, and this is the panel um, for the ventilator patients. So the mortality for ventilator patients ranges from, you know, a little over 10% to 100%. And look, there are just a ton of hospitals where 100% of the patients on the vent are dying, right? And so there's become this thing that sort of says, okay, well, maybe COVID patients shouldn't like be put on a vent. Maybe their lung disease isn't the same as other people. Um, but even if you just look at mortality among patients who are hospitalized, look here, here, this, this hospital has 100% mortality, right? This is just among all patients in the hospital. And it's just this tremendous variation. So what I thought was, well, maybe it's a problem about resources at the hospital. So um, I don't know if you can see, I'm going to try to share my screen with you. Um, so you can see it. this is what, this is how I kind of think about it. So like if you think about a hospital, right, um, every hospital in America has had to duplicate itself, meaning that there's um, uh, COVID um, wards and not COVID wards, and there's COVID ICUs and regular ICUs, right? You have to duplicate because rule number one, you cannot put a COVID patient in a non-COVID bed, right? Because the COVID patients have to have negative pressure and all this stuff, right? So that's kind of rule number one. So um, uh, rule number two is ventilator patients have to go to the ICU, pretty much, right? Like you can put them in the floor, but like man alive, that's a kind of special circumstance. So pretty much if you're on a vent, you have to go to the unit. So if you think about it, right? So if the whole COVID ICU is filled up with ventilator patients, then the people who ought to have been in the uh, COVID ICU get shunted to the COVID floor because there's no place else for them to go, right? No room at the end because you're full with the COVID patients. So the question is, so if you think about like what proportion of your ICU is filled with the vent patients, it's kind of like the 
COVID ICU vent burden, right? And it's uh, sort of like, how much room at the end do you have? And if you don't have very much room, you have this shunting kind of phenomenon, right? Does that sort of make sense? Okay, so we asked the question, well, you know, where do the hospitals fall? So if you look at it, um, so uh, uh, I don't know if you can see it, mm -hmm. but um, so if you, if you ask the question, how many of the hospitals were 30% of the ICU patients were on the vent? Well, about a third of the hospitals were like that. And the bulk of the hospitals are in this middle zone between 30% and 50%. But um, about 15% of the hospitals, more than 60% of the ICU beds are filled with vent patients, right? So it's not like, there are a few where it's like 80, 90% of the ICU is filled with vent patients, but mostly it's like in the sort of 60 to 80 range, okay? So the question is, is there worse mortality if you have more burden? And the answer is, the answer is? Yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> you were paying attention. Good job. Who <laughs> Tom, I didn't hear you answer. No, I, I did say yes. You held back? <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, okay, so, and um, the thing, <laughs> I mean, I think they can handle it. They're robust. It's okay to do this. <laughs> So, um, so anyway, so the general ward, um, if, you're, if your ICU capacity, if the burden was more than 60%, your general ward mortality is uh, twice as high. And your ICU mortality among the poor people who are not on the vent, almost three times as high. So the deal is, so you're like, okay, well, that's cool. But so like, the thing is, right, as a health yeah, not well, no, I mean, but it's like, I mean, it's an interesting finding or whatever, but like the thing is, right, you can do something about this, right? So I don't know, like Scott in your community, how they took care of, of COVID patients, but here in Indy, right, right downtown, we've got four hospitals that are all within walking distance of each other. And, we'll, and the decision that was made by the Department of Public Health was, okay, um, Methodist Hospital, that's going to be the COVID hospital. So it was filled, you know, to the brim. And all the ICU, pay, all the vent patients were at Methodist. And University Hospital and the County Hospital Eskenazi, they had some COVID patients on the wards, but not so much. It was really everything shunted to one hospital. And a lot of healthcare systems did that. But you don't have to design it that way. You could do it differently, right? So like most big universities, right? They Like, you know, IU, they've got hospitals everywhere. And there was this maldistribution where some of the hospitals had like, and still, like, it's going on, like, in San Antonio and stuff. And so if we had a healthcare system that was, like, you know, operating as a system and not just, like, this hospital and that hospital, and theoretically it could be, right, because the Department of Public Health actually has the ability to sort of say, no, 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 you've got to, you know, use your resources in a certain way. There, there is precedent for doing that. Then theoretically, right, they could say, okay, dudes, you can't exceed 60%, you know, vent burden or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so anyway, so that's kind of what I've been working on this week. The tricky part of doing this analysis is you can imagine vent patients are the sickest patients, right? So in order to like say it's twice the mortality, you have to adjust for everything you can that sort of equalizes the sickness, right? And so, um, so we've just are trying to be so careful that we're not just saying the patient, the hospitals that have the sickest patients have the more mortality. We don't want to say that. Um, and so, uh, so that's you know we're, why we're trying to be careful about it. But anyway, so, that's what I wanted to share with you. So, so will this work uh, be published, or will it get oh, submitted yeah. as a report? Yeah, so we're, um, we've put it, or we formatted it for a brief report for the journal JAMA. Um, they've been publishing a lot of things pretty quickly about COVID, so that's, okay. that's where we'll send it. So in terms of policy, you know, how this could, because it sounds like, you know, resource distribution might be an issue if I'm understanding you properly, right? Uh, then uh, in terms of policy making, um, I guess, how could that be translated uh, from journal yeah. article into, you know, someone who 
is in the policy making position taking these studies yeah, no, so so like right now, if you don't have a if you don't have enough beds, right, your hospital goes on diversion, right? Mm -hmm. Like your ED can no longer accept patients, you're on diversion. And that's an accepted part of American medicine, right? And so so it would just create a new diversion rule that says, okay, you, you don't just even have to have a bed, you have to have uh, beds without vent patients in them. And it's a pretty easy numerator and denominator, total number of vent patients, I mean, total number of ICU patients, how many do you have on the vent, right? I mean, and, um, and it's been shown like in other, you know, not in COVID, but like, you know, if you stress out your ICU, right, those are the sickest patients, they require, you know, the most intensive nursing and physician um, staff, like the outcomes are bad, right? I mean, and that's been shown like in MI and like in lots of conditions, right? If you, if you use, if you, you know, sort of, a, if you, they call it strain. If you strain the ICU, you have worse outcomes. And so this is just another, you know, example of that. Nice. Like in the VA, what they, for example, are doing, so like, um, uh, 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 the VA in San Antonio was so full, they were actually, I mean, way beyond this, right? But they were actually having to ship their vent patients to Dallas. That's not right next door, you know, Dallas yeah. to San Antonio, right? But, but I mean, like, so there's an example where you actually have a whole healthcare network, right? You could actually send people around. But like, I don't think you have to do that, right? I mean, uh, like hospitals are pretty geographically, not in rural America, but you know, the bulk of patients are actually not in rural America, they're in urban America, where you have densities of hospitals and, and you could totally, you know, change how that uh, patient distribution is happening. That's so exciting, Donnie. That could save a lot of lives. Uh, we have to see, like maybe, you know, I think the thing is like another healthcare system should do this analysis. It's just um, uh, right now people aren't reporting anything or not so much at the facility level. It's all at these population levels, right? Kind of in that same vein, uh, I was curious, are you getting your data directly from inside the VA or have you yeah. had any issues getting data uh, since the CDC is no longer collecting for the United States? Same question. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, we get it all from the VA. Yeah. And the, the new reporting, right? They're not taking VA data, what I read in the paper. So people have been asking me, like, I don't, I, I've not been following what's going on. That They eviscerated the CDC and now the, the reporting is supposed to go to DHS directly or HHS, right, Health and Human Services directly. And but they haven't been able to figure it out. Hospitals aren't allowed to report COVID tests to the CDC? There's something weird about the rules for hospitals reporting COVID cases. Uh, well, we are independent of all that. Like we get the actual lab data from the VA. So, yeah. so this is fascinating to me because honestly, I, I only really hear about what happens like, you know, not in the VA, like from friends and, you know, like uh, I'm not, Knowing very much this about it. Me a plot. Uh, she'll, she'll share it with you, but it's going up with, with uh, the. Um, let's see. So the CDC is reporting, and you know the numbers are going up and up, and then uh, NHS uh, starts taking over reporting, and it's just like. A, Can you? Oh yeah, yeah. Sorry, this is not the best way to share this graph, but the the green is when CDC is in charge of the reporting, and then the red is. Right. I have to say, man, the CDC has seemingly crumbled, but yeah, yeah I, I don't think uh, you can trust uh, the numbers anymore, I'm afraid. Yeah, that's what uh, some of the CDC professionals were saying was not only that doesn't make sense, but there's internally contradictions with the HHS data uh, that, you know, can't really be resolved. Uh, and of course, there always is going to be that on such a large data set. So, you know, but now I think we have nefarious purposes for that, so. Yeah. How did we get here? Not just the COVID-19, but in a point where the numbers are fabricated. I mean, this is not North Korea or China, no? <laughs> it's trump <-Ferica. laughs> 
Yeah. Hey, it's dinner time here, so I'm gonna have to drop off. But you guys, uh, I really appreciated the discussion and what you guys have shared. Uh, I'll just leave you with this. One thing I learned today when I was uh, listening to podcasts is uh, it sounds like there's some sort of correlation, not necessarily causation, with uh, vitamin D and seriousness of COVID cases. So get out there, get your exercise in the sun, and maybe it'll work. And and I agree with the. The, the pessimistic point of view, but I just add, you know, even if uh, you are, you know, that little guy with the one finger in the in the dike trying to stop the dam from breaking. I mean, you're doing it because it's the right thing, not not because you're going to win, but it's the right thing to do. So, thanks. Go do good things, everybody. Okay. Love you, Scott. Thanks, Scott. Love singing. you. Bye. <laughs> um. Yeah. Okay. Well, I've got uh, one thing to share, if uh, if I can. Uh, Please. Is. Yeah, might have to. Is going to be backwards. Yeah. Or backwards for you, them. Not for us. Can you read that? It's a backwards. Yeah. Nine thirty a.m. So it's uh, it's no. Nine thirty days. Ninety three days. Yep. So the election. Oh, oh just the oh. <laughs> so, what are the, what are the two markers below indicating? These are going to be probably minutes and seconds, but uh, <laughs> the uh, the hour before our meeting, and uh, and I just thought of this idea to make this countdown clock for the election. So, you know, I don't think on the big scale, uh, you know, I feel a little bit helpless, but on the uh, local scale of this election, I think we can really all do something and all do our part to make sure that uh, Donald Trump isn't elected again. And, and there's 93 days left. So, you know, don't think this is, this is uh, you know, uh, this is not gonna be forever. Uh, you know, I think we can uh, take some time each day to see what we can do to, uh, to make sure that Donald Trump is not gonna be there for four more years. And it's not gonna get us out of all our trouble, but, uh, it's a start, and pretty thing you put your finger in the dike, you know, that's, that's where we got to start. We all got to go and vote. <laughs> well, well, talk to your friends, you know, even friends that, uh, you know, may not agree with you. I don't know if, if um, anyone knows anyone out there who is thinking about not voting or voting for uh, someone other well, than Biden. We need Biden. your state of Wyoming, Justy. <laughs> I mean. Yeah. Well, well, you do have Kanye there. Oh, <laughs> oh, is yeah. he on the ballot? Uh, He's in like, I don't know. He lives yeah. in Wyoming. He lives in Wyoming. Oh, I, Kanye West. Yeah. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh. Come on, keep up, we can keep up. <laughs> Katie, Kanye West. <laughs> huh? Hey, happy birthday, Jim. <laughs> hey. Happy birthday. Thanks. I'm awake. <laughs> That's a good thing to be. Good to see everybody. Well, I have two things to share if we have time. Absolutely. Um, well, maybe I was gonna I was gonna do them in the reverse order, but um, but along the lines. So so far, I've raised a few hundred dollars for the League of yes. Women Voters with my congratulations, Beanie. For me, what? Congratulations, Beanie. Oh, thanks. So um, anyway, but I wanted to show you this table that I made. Can you guys see it? Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. So these, these are the diversity torsos. And um, I don't know. So I just, a friend who's an artist said. You got, you got it over the best part. Go back. Can yeah, you, we want to see it more. A little see longer. It. Well, while you're talking about it, just keep it on there. Okay, can, can you see it? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so anyway, so um, so this friend of mine introduced me to um, some galleries and I thought that maybe I could raise a little bit more money if I sold them kind of more as a sculpture rather than as actual soaps. And so, um, so anyway, so I'm gonna try to do that this week. So that's- The greatest soap though, we've been using it. 
<laughs> Mom asked how quickly the legs fall off. I think she thought that was a critical design flaw. <laughs> anyway, um, you can mash them together. They cross. Yeah. So, so, are those all legs standing up and you have a glass on top? Yeah. Okay. No, no, no. It's the other way around. No, the glass and the little legs are standing. Oh, okay. <laughs> Beanie, you got to show a leg. I uh, saw the leg. I thought it was other well, way around. Yeah. <laughs> well, no, and you got to show the fabricational noise. I'm sorry. I hate to be so uh, pushy. There you go. <laughs> oh, look, AC's showing her inventory. Nicely done. AC's done. Amy, Amy and Jesse oh. bought the whole set. So I oh, made wow. I made these diversity torsos. They're in all the yeah. See, Jesse's got three D printed. No, no, they're soap. They're oh, soap. They're soap. Oh wow, oh that that's I'm fancy. Good. And the goal was so that the the color of the soap shouldn't match your idea of what it should smell like. So the purple ones are lemon. Um, the gray <laughs> ones are. Bergamot, the anyway, so on. Wow. Here you can can you see yeah. the fabricational noise? Right. It's pretty yeah. cool. So how yeah. how do you make them? You have a mold? I have a mold. Okay. Yeah. So that was one thing I wanted to share. Kind of like Dawny, but not as as cool. I wanted to share a failure of mine from the week. Wow. Oh yay. Yes, and I love that. Thank you so much. No one it's a failure, so I, I love that. It's just as important. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Mm -hmm. So what you see here is an analysis that we did for, um, for 1.4 million children aged 0 to 18 years. What you see in the green line are children last year, and in the blue line, children this year. And this is their rate of routine wow. immunizations. And so what you notice is that there's always a spike in January. Kids always get more vaccinations at the beginning of the year for a variety of reasons. And, and we saw that spike in January. And this is March 13th, the day that the pandemic was announced in the United States. And what you see is overall a 24% decline in pediatric routine vaccinations. Um, and I don't know what the shape of this curve will be like. These are the data that we have so far. We're updating it now. Um, among children, the most vulnerable, I would argue, between the ages of zero and two years, the decline in routine vaccinations was 28%. So that was the, the greatest decline. And so on the basis of this, um, so this, so my team did this work and then, um, and then we worked with the marketing department at Castlight and sent out, we could identify the kids who didn't have their vaccinations. So we sent their parents letters and, you know, to be honest, so I don't even know exactly what the letters said, because I just sort of said like, oh, okay, you know, they're marketing people. These are the experts at marketing, right? And um, never has a marketing campaign been so successful. And these parents called in and were furious. They were like, they didn't sort of say like, who the fuck are you to say that I'm a bad parent and that, you know, like what, you know, what exactly am I supposed to do? And the marketing people were completely defensive and they were like, you know, this was like a very new, the, the language was very neutral. We weren't blaming anyone. And, you know, and so it was at that point that I actually like read the emails and, you know, whatever, like, I think an upset parent has every right to feel however they do. But I just sort of felt like, well, gosh, you know, like, and so, so the nurses who report to me had to like then, you know, make it all okay. And it just really felt like such a reminder of even if you are well-intentioned that you have to be just like, I don't know, so incredibly careful and, you know, think about, like bring so much empathy to the situation for how somebody might, you know, think about that. And, you know, and, and many of these parents were like, well, fuck you, I have one scheduled next week. And what would you have done? And it just, 
Um, anyway, do-gooderism, you know, that sort of didn't land so well. Oh, oh. Mary Beanie. Okay, those are my things. Wow. So um, I guess, uh, are you going to have a follow-up with them? Are you going to try it again or? Yeah, yeah. But, but I might read the emails before they go out. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly I'll be more informed. Yeah. Well, what I've been hearing is that actually, um, uh, or, you know, there's well, the problems of logistics on the pediatrician side. Right, mm -hmm. that um, it's actually a non-trivially difficult task to get the immunizations to the little babies, and so like trying, they have to like you know set up drive-bys, and like it's actually this right. So it could be that the families actually didn't have access to a pediatrician who had set it up uh, the right way, um, and so maybe the messaging is really I I don't know if you have the pediatricians contact information, but maybe that's the angle. Um, right, the safe way to go about it or. Yeah. I, don't, I think our just regular doctor isn't seeing any patients in her office until after the first of the year. Oh, wow. So I don't know how you would go about getting a vaccine right now. So, so are there vaccines that if you miss the window, uh, it will be too late or, uh, you know, well, the problem for these kids, still... yeah, the problem for these kids is it's a whole schedule. Okay. And you're supposed to get, you know, this one now and then get another one this way. And so their schedules are totally off. And so, you know, pediatricians have a hard enough time with this. If people like stay on schedule. Now it's just going to be even harder. Mm -hmm. And what I, so, so we submitted this for publication and what I said was, you know, like, so what are daycares going to do? Like, are you going to have your kids go to daycare? Like I have heard nobody talk about this in the context of return to school. And like, are we now going to have like measles and rubella outbreaks? I mean, like to hell with COVID, right? Like, and you know, and, and what is this, you know, these anti-vaxxers, what, what's going to happen with them? So, um, Anyway. Yikes. Hmm. Another example of how broken American healthcare is. Well, people are trying. Some are. <laughs> we tried. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My over optimism. There. <laughs> Show us your O face. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, see who's next. Lizzie. I changed my mind. I don't really want to show it anymore. <laughs> oh. If maybe if everyone. Uh, oh God. Thanks, sir. Here, I, I have what you, have Mama has something. Not right, it's not ready though. So we can wait on her instead. How about Laramie Crowd? You got anything? Give us a little rundown on your thesis. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been busy working on getting ready to defend my master's thesis. Uh, but I don't, I wish I had something more valuable to contribute here. What, what's your thesis on? So I have been studying um, relationships between climate changes and uh, ecosystem changes in subalpine landscapes over the last 6,000 years. Oh, wow. So I study lake sediment. You don't get any looks. <laughs> I was talking, I was talking all this stuff. We had an expert, you know, in the crowd. Um, I would love to hear, you know, your opinion regarding, you know, how to, you know, what do you think we can do to mitigate this issue? You know, what type of changes, you know, we I need to make I, as a society? How I, do we make those changes? Uh, 
with with regard to uh, uh, anthropogenic climate change, is that what you're? Well, asking? I guess just re regarding. Uh, just sure. Just, yeah. <laughs> huh? What did you say, Daddy? Just human cause. I don't know anything about this anthropogenic, but this uh, I know. I was going to say that's just human cause. <laughs> um, I, I I wish I I had a good answer for you. I think uh, I struggle a lot with pessimism about the whole thing. Um, especially with the, I mean, the perspective that I have uh, from a, like a paleo climate perspective and paleo ecological perspective is that these systems have have really a lot of inertia in a lot of a, in a lot of cases, and it takes a lot to change these systems dramatically. And uh, so, the fact that we see such rapid and dramatic change in the last century uh, is pretty disheartening to me because I know that these systems, it takes a lot to change them so dramatically. And it also, they continue to change long after you expect them to. Um, and I think that's one of the uh, biggest issues that we face uh, in trying to address something like, like human climate change is that even if we were to completely stop everything we do now, there would be still, uh, centuries of repercussions just because Earth's climate system and the systems teleconnected to that takes so long to equilibrate. And I mean, they never really equ equilibrate. They're always, uh, there are always feedbacks influencing, influencing the state of, of individual systems. But um, yeah, we, the ball is already rolling so fast that uh, when we when we knew about about greenhouse gases and the impact that CO two could have fifty years ago, you know that's when we should have been doing something. And it's very difficult for me to uh, to have any kind of optimism. That's I know that that's not a great message to communicate to everyone, um, but it's something that I mean I personally struggle with a lot. The more I learn about it, uh, mm -hmm. the more it just seems like. Uh, the more it just seems like we're going to really struggle to adapt. Uh, Are you and prepping? Then, what's that? Are you prepping? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but uh, I am glad that I will only live to, to 85 or, you know, not much longer than 85 years because uh, hopefully I'll miss the worst of it. That's looking on the bright side. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so uh, I'm super excited about my science. <laughs> but but it's hard to, to look forward. It's a lot easier to look backward. Um. Tell the group a little bit about how you're collecting the data and how you're, you're setting it. I think that's really interesting. Sure, yeah. I study uh, sediment archives from lakes on subalpine landscapes. So we go up in the mountains and we collect uh, basically just like big PVC tubes of mud from the bottom of a lake. And that mud slowly accumulates over time. And so we can slice it up into little sections and use radiocarbon dating to figure out how old those sections are. And then we can measure all kinds of things in the sediment to understand how the climate or the landscape has changed in the past. So the, the lakes that I work on, um, they have all these little fossil spruce and fir needles um, preserved in the sediment. And so looking at how the concentrations of those needles um, have changed through time, we can attempt to extrapolate as to how dense the forest was on this landscape in the past. Um, and then we can also measure things like uh, carbon isotopes and oxygen isotopes from those needles, but also just from the bulk sediment itself to understand how, um, how the hydrology of the landscape has changed over time. Um, we can study microbial activity and um, the byproducts of microbial activity to reconstruct how temperatures have changed through time. And so my work has really been studying each of these individual elements, but trying to understand how those things fit together and how maybe 
changes in the amount of snowpack on that landscape on multi-century century scales has affected how many trees can grow there or how temperatures may have influenced um, how dense the forest is there, things like that. Um, and my primary findings are pretty unique for my field because I have found that um, paleoecologists typically expect uh, forest fires to be a major component of how these landscapes respond to climate change because um, mature uh, healthy spruce trees can undergo lots of st climate stress before they die. And so ecologists typically think that large disturbances like forest fires kind of help those systems equilibrate to the, to the climate system. Um, but my results show that fires actually were not the major, the most important player in how these ecosystems have responded to change. And that in fact, the uh, uh, temperature and hydrologic forcing on stressing the trees directly may have had a more significant impact over the last 6,000 years on these forests relative to forest fires. So I'm sorry, you said temperature and what was the other thing? So temperature uh, and? Hydrology. So like uh, how much snow falls in the winter and how long the snow persists into the summer. Are you worried by the intense nature of her question and concerned about she might scoop you in some kind of conversation? I, I don't want to put ideas in your head, but it did seem a little intense, didn't it? What was that second item? <laughs> and now could you explain that in great detail? I didn't ask for that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. My, my committee will, will take notes from you and, and <laughs> behave in a similar manner. I was trying to find you, Tom, uh, the area where these sediments are collected are really beautiful and, and somewhat reminiscent in the mountains and the lakes oh. of the, the pictures you painted, but I couldn't quite oh. find a picture. So uh, we'll find one and send it send it to your way. He has a- Awesome. Uh, we have a beautiful one. I have awesome. a picture of the lake that I study. And I could, I could yeah. share that. Yeah, I would love to see. Yeah. There's a, there it is. Oh, the big, are they in the big horse? That's like no medicine though. It's Libby Flats, like right outside of Laramie. Ah. Uh, Laramie and, wow. or Laramie and Saratoga. Yeah. Wait, what is it? Outside of Laramie, Wyoming. Oh, I mean, okay. I heard Miami. I'm like, wow, there are mountains in Miami uh, now? <laughs> no, um, so it's about uh, an hour, two hours outside of town. Yeah. Oh, wow. So. It's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, um, one second. Let me share this Zoom link and Andrew what can So Andrew, that really is very interesting because I was reading, I've been reading about accelerated evolution and how and how um, uh, how temperature plays such a critical role in uh, you know the few zones in the planet where accelerated evolution happens. And so that kind of jives with what you're talking about. Yeah, I, um, if I were, I'm graduating in a few weeks and moving to a different university, but if I were to stay here, um, my advisor is working on some really cool uh, ancient DNA projects where they've been extracting DNA from these sediments to try to understand how they're focusing mostly on microbial communities and how microbes have adapted to respond to these changes and how we can use um, use DNA to re reconstruct these microbial assemblages and infer condition temperature and, and uh, like pH conditions, for example, from those. And so I think uh, microbes definitely uh, respond on timescales that we could even measure and, and use to better understand these interactions. So yeah, I'm kind of sad that I won't have as direct uh, role in, a, in that project, but it's really cool work. Where are you going? I'm going to Washington University in St. Louis. Oh, to, uh, coming closer. Yeah, if you drive yeah. through Indy, you gotta stop. Yeah, I will, I'll have to come visit sometime. Yeah. Hey, uh, you know, how long did it take for the Younger Dryas uh, cooling to, to happen? I mean, that's relatively quickly, right? And uh, how many years or so? Yeah, it's relatively quickly. I, I want to say a few hundred years, but 
I don't know off the top of my head, to be honest with you. So uh, that's that's one. You know, there is a, a, a last ditch effort where you could conceivably have drastic cooling in a short amount of time, right? You know, yeah, absolutely. I was thinking about that uh, in the shower this morning. Actually, I was thinking. Oh, me uh, too. <laughs> me too. Totally. <laughs> if if the uh, if if the the North Atlantic overturning circulation shuts down because we've melted so much of the Greenland ice sheet, we could feasibly experience another younger Dryas. Uh, and I'm sure there are tons of people trying to model that. I'm so sorry, uh, I don't know what that is. Younger Dryas? 11,000 years ago, there was a really abrupt and very cold period that's anomalous relative to the rest of uh, the surrounding geologic time. Um, and people study it all the time because uh, it directly impacted uh, humans at the time, and also uh, there, there was a really abrupt warming immediately following this period. And so uh, particularly climate contrarians like to use that as evidence that the climate system is so volatile that humans couldn't possibly have uh, influenced it so dramatically as, as we clearly are, or, uh, you know, other things. But uh, so the Younger Dryas uh, is m typically hypothesized to have occurred because um, the collapse of the Laurentide ice sheet, which covered most of Canada during the last glacial maximum, the collapse of that ice sheet put so much cold, fresh water into the North Atlantic that the ocean circulations, oce ocean circulation patterns that bring heat from the, from the equator north into the northern latitudes shut down. That circulation is primarily driven by mm. temperature and, and salinity gradients. And so if that circulation is disrupted by changes in those temperature and salinity gradients, then, uh, the, circ then the transport of heat uh, across latitudes would be interrupted. And that could, is, could potentially have caused a dramatic cooling event in the northern hemisphere, like, like the Younger Dryas. Um, so, so in but would it have heat? I'm sorry, but would it have heated up the equator because all the hot water is just stuck there then? Um, yeah, that would make a lot of sense. Uh, and there are some so. Part of the problem with understanding how the equatorial regions, especially in the equatorial Atlantic warmed, is that records there are really difficult to interpret. Um, and so, uh, especially in the southern hemisphere, um, there's really a deficit of information. And most of the information that we have about this period comes from ice cores from Greenland. So, uh, there probably are records that show warming in the equator, equatorial regions um, during the Younger Dryas, but uh, I don't know of them off the top of my head. I'm sorry. So it's we're we're saying the words Younger Dryas. Yeah. So yeah. the name so comes from. Is like, there like like baby Dryas that's coming up? <laughs> you know, like a like a neonatal Dryas happening? Or? Uh, the name comes from peat bogs in. Uh, in Ireland where they first discovered the event and driest flowers uh, grow in, yeah, there you go. Uh, driest are, they're, they're a type of flower that grow in very specific climates. And so the younger driest is characterized by these two, um, or the younger driest is this large decline in temperature, but there's also an older driest, which now we know to be Heinrich event one. And they're called the younger and older Dryas because in these peat bogs, um, geologists first discovered these layers of Dryas flowers, which are characteristic of much colder climates. And so they called it the younger Dryas layer and the older Dryas layer before they really knew uh, what they were about. And then once more research went into understanding the temperature history of the Northern, he Northern Hemisphere, the name just kind of stuck. Mm. So, you use my names in your publications. I, I you know, take, I give them to you freely. <laughs> so, so when you study your lake sample, 
in terms of ecological changes and, and vegetation and things like that, how rapidly are they changing? Right? Like if you were to make, I assume, you know, you're looking sort of as a time, time lapse of your past, right? And then, you know, you see some cycle and it just goes crazy, you know, and then, you know, and then new things emerge or things rapidly disappear. Can you, you know, help us imagine that time period a little bit? You know, yeah, in terms of plants or trees, you know, or animals. Yeah, uh, I can show you. That's the driest flower. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> They're beautiful. Um, so here is uh, the a picture of the lake that I study. Um, going back a little bit, uh, and and what's interesting about Th these lakes is that they're surrounded by huge dead spruce trees. Um, and so what originally motivated our question was, how did these trees die and why did so many of them die at once near these lakes? And so then when we went into the sediment and studied them in more detail, we found that Uh, all these fossil needles which show us that these lakes uh, changed at different times, but also relatively rapidly. So the top, you can ignore the gray polygons, but the, the, um, the black lines connecting each of these points, those are just uh, constant accumulation rates of needles into the sediment. Mm. And so here, there's a really dramatic decline in the rate of accumulation of needles at this site over the course of several hundred years. And this record goes back about 1500, 1600 years. Um, so that gives you an idea of, of the rate of change that we're talking about. Huh, so did, I assume it's too short time for new consumers? Um, so that's, um, that's, uh, that's also part of our question is, is why do all these trees die and then nothing regrew? And part of that likely is just that the, the climate was relatively unfavorable for the trees to regrow uh, uh, after those declines. Did you just get a practice hit pitch at 560 C's defense? In the way I did, yeah. Nice, that's a good deal. This is our good friend Gabe. He's usually in DC, but uh, he's out here for the summer. Hey, Hi, Gabe. Hey. how's it going? I've met some of you, but not all of you. Good to see all of you. Nice to see you. I don't want to take away from Andrew's oh, thesis. Please no, ask any, <laughs> any button in questions. <laughs> We all have a uh, Wyoming connection, uh, and now Utah does too. So Utah, I live in LA. Uh, Dina and Don, Dina in, in Casper. Uh, Don is, uh, grew up in Wyoming. Uh, grew up in Casper there. So that, that's the that's Wyoming connection, Gabe. What's your connection, Utah? He knows all of us. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You gotta come visit. I think uh, it would be a, a great vacation spot for you guys. I I would love to. Yeah, I know when this COVID dies. Yeah. Mm. Dina and Jim just moved back to Casper, so they are there too. Yeah, it's uh, it's absolutely wonderful to be here. It's but the I mean. It's wonderful and strange. I mean, Laramie Crew, I don't know how you feel, but I mean, it's just, the politics are just bizarre. I mean, isolating and weird. And, um, but the positive things are so amazing, right? So, you know, we, you want to tell them about the Braille Trail? Uh, in a minute, I think just at a macro level, it is just so bizarre. <laughs> There's people who are kind and um, helpful and sweet. And, uh, you know, little vignette today, I rushed out to a store to get something for the meal we're making for lunch. 
And I put on my mask and go in and nobody in the store, no customers, none of the staff are wearing masks. And I'm in the store for less than two minutes, check out, there's no line there. And I asked the checkout person, any chance that uh, you folks will be wearing masks anytime soon? And this, you know, early 20s person says, no, no chance. And I said, really? And is that management? Yes. And, uh, you know, we're just not going to do it unless we're forced to. And I said, wow, um, you know, I guess, um, you know, I'll think about coming back after the pandemic's over. And they said, that's fine. And I said, you know, I really care about the community. Um, and I didn't say anything more. I didn't feel the need to say anything more. And I don't think it would have been helpful to say anything more. But, um, you know, good luck. Keep, keep healthy and left. Wow. Where was and, and, you know, it's just... And they're, you know, they were very, you know, it was, if, if you had not heard the audio of that, you would, you would have thought it was just a customer and a sales person, you know, talking. Right. And to hear the audio, it's just, you know, there's some people who are saying, why is that asshole? You know, I'm sure the next person in line mm -hmm. would have been, been saying, why is that asshole even asking? Yeah, you so know, California I think, asshole tell me I got to wear a mask. Yeah. <laughs> But, but I, I think yeah. one thing you said earlier is true is that, right like so you know we think you, you'd think it's like so we see plenty of these like very long bearded you know they look like libertarian I don't know whatever <laughs> right like you know uh, you know lumberjacky types lots of tattoos right et but you know and but then but it's actually like young people yeah. I, you know like it, it there's not a it does, it's not a demographic ish thing it feel it, it is purely it strikes me a political thing um, i'll go into a store down the road and they'll take my temperature before i go in and they make sure i'm wearing a mask mm -hmm. you know uh, oh by the way you only see people in masks there what a surprise <laughs> yeah and you don't see many of the lumberjacks but we, we so mom and i went to a funeral yesterday of marilyn lyle and so I mean, there like the there were some grandkids of the lady who had died. Very, very nice lady who had died, who had worked for mom, and she she anyway. And um and it was so they held it specifically outside so that there'd be good ventilation. It was over by uh, these new baseball fields, and they have like a little rotunda thing, and there was like a little station with masks and like the you know sign in book with clean. Uh, pens and dirty pens mm -hmm. and um, and so the vast majority of people were octogenarians I mean, as the deceased lady had been and I mean there was not a single person who didn't have a mask on no I mean several of them were sort of you know chatting with their friends like this and you did sort of want to be like excuse me sir <laughs> right but you know and uh, <laughs> But, you know, it, like, like that seemed really sweet, you know, and then here to have people grieving and not to be able to see each other, all you could see was in someone's eyes, whether they were tearful or not. And yeah, um, so, yeah. I, uh. I'm surprised oh, we're, it sounds, oh, excuse here. me, sorry. Go ahead. I'm just surprised uh, it sounds so different in Casper. I think it's similar climate, but almost all the stores that we go to, all the employees wear masks. And I think we're estimating about 50% of the people wear masks overall in Laramie. So it um, sounds pretty different than in Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, my comment is pretty unrelated, except for <laughs> the word that you used. I'm sorry. Octogen. Oh, I'm sorry. What's your name? Gabe. Oh, I'm Gabe. Oh, hey, Gabe. I'm Dina. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, Dina. Yeah, good okay. to meet you. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, well, this would be a weird thing for me to jump in and say, first of all. So I'll introduce myself first. <laughs> I'm just a friend of uh, Emily and Andrews. I uh, grew oh, up here in Miami and live here right now. So what anyway, you I'll you I'm you here. Uh, uh, sorry, what's that? But you're in law school here when it's not COVID. 
That's right. Normally I'm in DC in, in normal times. We went to the uh, Wiccan Film Fest with him and his uh, fiance yes. uh, a few months ago. So. The Wiccan Film Fest? Reston. 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 Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Wiccan. I also went to the Wiccan Film Fest, but that was a different night. It yeah. was, it was equally That was bizarre. a full moon night. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, what were you going to say, Gabe? <laughs> Uh, well, now it just seems so. Uh, <laughs> you had a question about the word octogenarian? Not a question so much as that. There's the same uh, word for twenty-year-olds. A piece of edification. A piece of edification about that. Does anyone know though? Is anyone familiar with the the rule against perpetuities? It, it's a principle of property law. I wouldn't expect any person who enjoyed it. <laughs> probably know. We we have one lawyer in the crowd. Oh, okay. Are you? Okay. Well, this might that, come as a corporeal heritage. I'm an expert at it. Oh, okay. Here we go. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> well, go ahead. I just wanted to share that <laughs> it's, it's like my favorite thing in law school that I've learned so far, and I named my band after this principle, so I'll explain. The rule against perpetuities basically has to do with like what you can do with your property and how long you can affect the movement of your property after you're dead. And so basically it's like you, you can create a property and you can give a property interest to somebody else, but that will only last 21 years after the death of the current living person's next spawn basically i mean it, it, it is a crazy rule but the point is is that you have to calculate like who can currently give who can currently give birth and 21 years after the death of that person is like the the length that that interest is valid and anyway there's this principle in in, in <laughs> accounting how long that can be called the fertile octogenarian <laughs> And what this, what this principle is to help you determine the length of this vesting period is that like anyone who is breathing can give birth to a child in that exact moment. So the rule is called the fertile octogenarian. So you can have like an, a 104 year old terminally ill person about to croak on their deathbed. But if you like write your will in that exact moment that it is legally possible for that person to have a child in the next in the next minute for purposes of this particular legal principle. So that was a long way of saying that there's that was a great word to have chosen. Uh, and it made me think of <laughs> in the same vein of this, I learned the same word for 20 year olds is visigenarian. Visigenarian. Oh, good one. Wow, wow. good one, Emma. Like, what, what was the concept that you <laughs> typically <laughs> typically it can change anyway nice to meet you all <laughs> that was all I so fertile octogenarian is your band yes yes my <laughs> my my law school's 1l class we decided that if we made a, a, a law school rock band that it would be called the fertile octogenarians <laughs> I would so title of our sex tape too. Oh, so. Justin. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, honey. You're not quite octogenarian. I know, that's the funny part about it. <laughs> played, in, played right into your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, it's, you know, it plays on prime time, so that's a valid joke in a Zoom call with <laughs> adults. So. so are you going to school remotely from Laramie? Um, I will be going to school remotely. I I'm actually going to head back to D.C. In a right before school starts, but it, it would make no difference. It's all remote, so yeah. And how about Maggie? Uh -huh. Yeah, she'll be back. Maggie's my fiance. Uh, she works in DC as well, and she'll she'll stay remote too. So we really could just stay out in Laramie if we wanted to, but I think I'm regressing at home. I need to I I, I need to clean my room. I like I need to go back and live my own life. I think. <laughs> so Gabe, I'm so sorry to pester you about this, but how do we calculate the duration of the perpetuity? So like, so like, if like. So, okay, 
like because so if I have a baby, right, then they live a life and and you get 21 years after the end of that baby's life. That's correct. So so how long how long does my baby get to live? 80? How I mean, how much do you estimate the length of my baby? Oh, it doesn't. It's not about cap. Sorry, I think I used the wrong word. It's not about calculating it in advance. It's just that that interest no longer becomes valid 21 years after the death of the last living. So, so Donnie, if you want to uh, uh, have your property stay in the family forever, like you're a Wyoming rancher and you want your property to always be in the family, you cannot write anything that will stand up to make sure that you know five generations hence four generations hence three generations hence well i mean unless my baby is smart enough to write it in their will right yeah exactly they can write it in their will seriously yeah. but you can't you can't but, make but that happen how did the rockefellers and the vanderbilts and all those people did this not work i mean because it's been around since AC. old england yeah so like common law tradition. I'm sure they were just smart enough and just kept it in their own family, you know, like they didn't have a problem with that. But yeah, this came, this came about from like the kings and queens, it being like a problem with people keeping property way longer and, and it being a frankly non-efficient use of property. So the judges of old common law decided that that's not cool anymore. <laughs> so they just created this arbitrary rule. So I don't know if we have time for another topic, but you know, I think <laughs> and Lizzie and I were texting a little bit, but right, so there was an earlier comment about, I think it's basically a concern about greed today, right? So, so I think there is a concern that people who are, right, that, I mean, we are undergoing this enormous, like, shift in wealth, right? And it feels egregious and horrible. And, but, but there's like a good part of it. Right, then that good part is like the American spirit of entrepreneurship. Yes. And, you know, and that, you know, with risk comes reward. And this law is kind of interesting in that, right? And maybe, maybe like this isn't, you know, sexy 80 year olds notwithstanding, um, you know, like, like maybe, right, there's something to be said for. Like, like so many people, I think, think about generational wealth versus like life altering wealth, right? So like you and like the person who invents like today, a pill that like eradicates coronavirus deserves like all the money in the world, you know, I mean, like, like to save all those lives, right? But, but maybe like, we would feel differently about that transfer of wealth if it wasn't generational. Gabe, your thoughts? You're still on mute. You're saying, oh, sorry. So just, just so I'm clear about what we're saying, you're saying that we feel more okay with people or you're saying that we feel more okay with somebody making a lot of money because there are restrictions on how that wealth can be passed generationally? That's right. So, so that there, there were, I'm not sure if you were tucked away secretly listening or you just arrived, but, um, uh, but we, earlier we were talking about this idea that you know, it feels really egregious. Uh, that people are, certain people are making so much money. And the word greed was not used, but I think that that's really like what it feels like, right? Especially at a time when there's such income disparity. So I think, you know, people care a lot about that. And maybe it wouldn't, maybe we wouldn't feel so angry if it was like kind of more of a meritocracy that didn't then create a, an entire generational system um, of, you know, like that entire group of people now has advantages that aren't, you know, and, and so this could be like a level setting kind of thing if we sort of said like, mm, you can't like pass it on to your kid more than a little bit. Or yeah, I mean, I think, I think as a, I think you're right. I think as a principle of like metering how much you can, you know, pass wealth on to, to people who've done nothing to deserve it, that it's probably good to just, <laughs> Put a, put, a, put the brakes on that too much. Now, the extent to which the rule against perpetuities does that, I think that, you know, they've, people have found all kinds of ways around that. So, you know, I don't know, 
if that particular rule actually does all that much anymore. It's basically just like some stupid thing you study in law school that like used to exist and technically still does. But like, but I think what, I think what you're saying like makes total sense in that like, you know, restrictions on like, on, on like, like what you can pass to your children or the extent to which your estate is taxed or maybe restrictions on how much you can transfer, you know, something in the way of a gift right before you die so that it's not taxed as a, as, as an estate tax, you know, the restrictions on those kinds of things should be popular to people who feel upset about it. Now, I don't know. I, I think that it's always just gonna, that, that, that like would require someone who feels like really upset about wealth staying in families and who feels really upset about like wealth inequality to have like this really like far sighted view of how like wealth should be managed which one should, but I think that people who feel like the most and rightfully so upset about how like wealth is distributed are kind of like maybe more focused on like the short term, like how do we redistribute wealth in, in you know, in my lifetime, <laughs> not like, you know, 21 years after the death of my. Yeah. So like what if Jeff Bezos's fortune went to Amazon employees after he dies? Yeah, I mean, that would probably, we, people would probably be stoked about that. I, I, I don't know, you know. <laughs> And, and how much would that like limit how like entrepreneurial Jeff Bezos was? Probably not that much because he's still acting in, kind of in his own self-interest, but um, yep. yeah, I don't know. But, the, but a corporation never dies, you know? A corporation does not die. So, you know, you, you can put all your wealth in the corporation and then the next like leading shareholder, you know, takes the wealth, so. But I think you're so right. And I think that you have some really good points about that. Yep. Yeah, it's tax policy drives most of those things nowadays. And uh, the Republicans are very against a state tax. And yeah, they want lower tax. <laughs> and what have we got coming up here? This is just a little go back. Uh, Lizzie uh, shared this with me earlier. Wow. To everyone, but uh, yeah, this is uh, the new uh, data from the HSS. Well, you know, they flatten the curve. Yeah. <laughs> Literally twisted. Mission accomplished. That's one curve. You know, it's like Trump got his wall. Europe built it for him. <laughs> yeah. And his other wall blew over in the storms on the southern border. Yeah, that was great. Wow. With a steamroller, not with um, any yeah. actual limiting of the viruses, but... They sure got the numbers down. You can see those pictures from just the, okay. the opposite of greed. Okay, yeah, show me. Uh, I see those two. Okay, uh, hang on just a sec. Amy's got something here. Oh, wow. I see. Wow. So that's kind of the opposite of greed. We had a big collection yesterday and uh, received almost 6,000 pounds of food, 5,400. Wow. Amy Claire. Wow. It wasn't, but it's exciting. Totally. Heartwarming. Wow. So I think it'll uh, be in big need when the, this extra money is uh, not coming starting now, right? The bonus. Oh God, Amy, look. It's good. Isn't it? It's amazing. It is awesome. It's all the stuff in, in, in two hours. Yeah. There was a team of people sorting it all into all these categories. And uh, yeah, it was really, really amazing to see. It's the first time I've participated in it, but Amy and Elizabeth have been doing this for the whole time. So, well, Amy, how long will, will, will something like this? last you know like like how, how how many how many weeks days months will this get you through so this um we get this size of a donation from this guy um that organizes this collection every other month so right before we started this on saturday most of the tables were empty so it lasts some a month or so we have regular smaller donations that come in too and we have a ton of money right now, so we can buy what we need also, but. Which you have been doing. Right, but this physically, what's in there will will last a month, mostly. 
since COVID started, they've been giving uh, really substantial contributions to their um, pantry in cash. So thousand yeah. dollar contributions on a regular basis. So they, uh, so they, they have uh, enough money to hold them through for a little while, but. Uh, and we're sending, we send out grocery gift cards to families as well every month. So because we're just giving a pre-packed bag, so it's not necessarily everything that people need, but. Mm. Are you going through, are you going through more? I'm sure maybe you already talked to this, but I'm sorry, but are you going through more food these days or is it less because school's not in session or, or, or what's that look like? Well, we still, we are, this space right here is um, being donated to us right now because we can't be in our school, but we still distribute from our school. So once a week, we serve about a hundred families and we, it's timed in conjunction with the county's distribution, they do a grab and go breakfast and lunch meal every day. So we are there once a week and we give a bag, 25 pounds of food, shelf stable food. We also get a huge donation from Trader Joe's that we distribute um, fresh produce meat and sometimes. meat, sometimes um, flowers, sometimes eggs. So people get from us a a bag of staples, fresh produce, sometimes meat, sometimes eggs, sometimes flowers, and then they can pick up their meals from the county on the same day. And toiletries. Yeah, and, to, and uh, yeah, always hygiene products and uh, soap every week. But there, it's only open for 30 minutes and it's mostly a drive-through. Some people walk up, but most families drive. drive and some families pick up for other families, but we've been giving out about a hundred bags a week. And that was about what they were averaging before, right? We oh, were, I was just gonna say, it seemed like you had more than that at school. Yeah, we did, 200, yeah. but it could have been people in the same family, I'm not sure. But definitely not more. Not a more lot of, right now. A lot of people have experienced huge. Yeah, 500% jump in their yeah, clients. And you guys we haven't had that but. yet. AC, how close is the nearest next pantry? Like, is it, you know, is your catchment area growing, shrinking, staying the same, and how big is it? Our area is, um, although we don't, you know, we don't ask for proof of need or or anything. We ask people which school because we, our statement is that we serve any, anybody with a child that will come at some point to South Lakes. So anyone in the pyramid, preschool, elementary, middle, high school that will come to our, so it's Reston mainly. Um, so there's also another pantry in Reston, but it's more paperwork to get food from them. Is that Cornerstones? Cornerstones. Um, so our, our area hasn't necessarily changed. I'm not sure why our numbers have been a flat kind of. I'm surprised by that. Is it because if it's drive through, they don't have transport? Well, it's, I think the rumor came, went out about the Hearts of Palm, man. <laughs> you know. We even ran out of Hearts of Palm this week, Amy. <laughs> we didn't have any vegetables. <laughs> Shocking. But there was a, a donation of body butter, so. <laughs> Four years expired mint jelly was the real winner yesterday. <laughs> I thought I could probably retrieve it from the trash. <laughs> yeah, 6,000 pounds of food in assorted in two hours was pretty amazing to see. Super fun. It is really neat. What is the weird, what's the hearts of palm version in this? There's got to be some. There's plenty of funky stuff, always. <laughs> The mint jelly was gross. I mean, that yeah, that was icky. And something from 2012, I think, was there. There was something from 2009. Oh, 2009. It was tea from 2009, which, you know, if you put it in boiling water, I'm sure it's going to be fine. <laughs> <laughs> you guys should come to mom's pantry. <laughs> oh, my God. Her freezer. Her fridge. <laughs> I listen to that every day. So. Yeah, mama <laughs> cleaned out our freezer pretty recently, which is a heroic task, and found some stuff 
from a yeah. really long time ago. Before Elizabeth was born. I think it was younger Dryas Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. Uh, well, uh, thank you all for having me. I need to drop out now. Um, Thanks, Sutil. We'll, we'll talk talk with you all again at some point. Keep painting. Uh, keep painting. Alrighty. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. All right. Good night. Good night. Stay safe. <laughs> Justine, thank you so much for hosting us. I was just going to say the yeah. same thing. It's really like such a refreshing, wonderful, fun thing. Thank you. You guys are a great group. It's, it's so good. Uh, so uh, should we meet again in another month or two months or so? One month. What do you say? One or two. Hold up your hands. What, what are the choices? One, one month months. or two one months? Month two months. Okay. Dave, you have to, you're a voting member. He's got one. He's got a little pinky, Donny. Thank you. Okay. So, Donny, can we see your notes? <laughs> and you did you vote, Donny? Oh, I'm going with the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> you if never I, vote with the crowd. No, I'm tonight. My favorite is my um, driest flower. Oh, I love it. Oh, wow. Andrew, you're laughing. I see you. <laughs> yeah, that's great. I love it. I'm, it's, I'm laughing because I like it. It's oh, great. good. That's, that's awesome. Yay. <laughs> okay. Well, awesome. Thank you, guys. Thanks Thank you. you. Happy, happy Thank birthday, you. Jim. Thank happy you. birthday, Jim. Ciao. Yeah. Yeah. Yay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.